So obviously, I'm going to be talking to you today about the Internet of Things. That's what we've been talking about all day. Um, although, slight variation from what we've been saying so far today, because I'm actually going to talk about how the Internet of Things doesn't exist. Um, which I know might be a slightly controversial thing to say at an Internet of Things conference. Um, so I might, let me temper that just maybe a little bit. I'll change that to the Internet of Things won't exist. How about that? We just sort of say that for a moment. And before I get right into it, I want to share with you something that uh, well, I'm really proud of. It's a, it's a great innovation that I came up with. It's a way to come into a room full of 100 or more people and with a single image, I can determine which amongst you are millennials, Generation X, or baby boomers. All right, everybody ready for this? It's pretty cool, here we go. Single image. And you'll notice it is ATT branded, by the way, Al. But this is just for you. Okay. <laughs> if you have never physically seen or used one of these devices, raise your hand. Anybody here never actually used one of these devices? Okay. You, my friends, are millennials. All right? Hands up if you have ever used one of these devices but did not buy it yourself. Uh-huh. Right? You, my friends, are Generation X. And if you bought one of these devices with your own credit card and had a credit rating at the time, you're probably a baby boomer. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even older, right? Um, for those of you millennials in the room, sorry, I, I should translate it's like uh, Eric Morris over here. For those millennials in the room, this is called an answering machine. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> A revolutionary device when it came out. And I, I should point out that when it came out, there were no iPhones, right? We had no cell phones. Your phone was at home. And so if you weren't at home and somebody called you, you missed it. Right? The, the answer machine solved huge problems so that you were no longer in the situation where, I don't know, let's say the super cool nine-year-old Jessie Steinberg calls you up because she wants to go to 31 Flavors, but your stupid sister doesn't take the message, and so instead she goes with Chris Corkill, and they have a good time, and then wind up getting married and moving to Calgary and having three kids and posting incessantly about on Facebook. But, Sorry, I, I, I'm going to digress slightly there for a second. I mean, uh, the point is, answering machines evolved. And about 10 years later, turned into this. This is an IVR system produced by Cisco Systems. Uh, I bought one of my last company, cost about $50,000. We had a Cisco network engineer come out for a week to program it. Okay? And it was the press one if you want to get to accounting, press two if you want customer support, all that kind of thing, right? And nobody like these. Um, but the point is that my next company, about 10 years later, instead we're now using this, Grasshopper. Grasshopper, web-based, platform as a service, 12 bucks a month, does all the same things that the Cisco system version did. Now, you might be wondering, what does any of this have to do with Internet of Things? And the reason why it's important is that it shows the evolution of an industry, where we went from my stupid sister to the answering machine, to the enterprise-grade solution, to the platform as a service, which is essentially free, produced by people like Google and Grasshopper. Right? This is showing the evolution of that industry, and it's something that repeats over and over again, and it really drives home the point that those who don't understand history are bound to repeat it. And it's important for us as we're looking at the IoT industry to understand what has come before. Because the IoT world today is full of answering machines. Kickstarter has got hundreds of them. We've seen some of them in the other room today. Really cool, innovative devices that really solve a problem that I guarantee you, 10 years from now, will not be around. Right? The AT&T presentation today showed the dongle that can go into the OBD port on your car to get all the telematics out of the car. Really cool stuff. I just bought a new Volvo about three months ago. It's got that built in. You don't need the dongle anymore. It has, comes with an app. I can do all of that directly from the vehicle. Right? OnStar from GM, the new version, does the same thing. 
all of this just disappears. Where every fridge comes connected, every thermostat comes connected, Nest goes away because it just becomes a thermostat. Who here in the room has a smartphone that has some cloud-based voicemail solution from your carrier or built into the phone? Right? Everybody. Who here owns an answering machine? Nobody. <laughs> One guy. <laughs> Congratulations, sir, you won the prize. <laughs> right? The reason you don't own one is because you don't need one. AT&T does not sell them anymore, right? Because it's been built into the cloud. It's a service. And that's what's really interesting. At CES this year, 900 exhibitors out of the 3,800 said they had IoT products, right? Gartner is saying that we're going to hit 6.4 billion connected things, one per human on the planet within the next 12 months, going up to over 20 billion by 2020. IBC is, is predicting that the IoT space is going to grow, revenue-wise, 17% compounding annually, up to $1.3 trillion by 2019. That's a crazy statistic, right? And that's why a couple of the other presenters mentioned, hey, people are just flooding in to the IoT space, right? I even heard that universities are putting on conferences <laughs> I'm like, I'm and people are coming to them, right? Now, where have we seen this before? I, I don't know, maybe in uh, London, maybe? Now, here's what's interesting about gold rushes. The people, the masses, who rush into them and struggle to get in that line to get their prospect rarely are the millionaires. They're rarely the ones who succeed. If we look back at history and we try and learn that from an IoT perspective, and we say, what lessons can we take from the Klondike to apply to the IoT space, right? Who made money in the Klondike? It was the people selling the picks and axes, right? They're the ones who made the fortune. Well, in the IoT space, those are the app development platforms, the SDKs, the chipsets, and the toolkits to support IoT. We've heard Raspberry Pi mentioned, I think, four times already today, right, of how many new devices are using them. Never mind the Pine A64, which is just coming out, which blows Raspberry Pi out of the water. It's amazing, right? AppMaker, my own platform, we'll talk about in a minute, for building mobile apps in a cost-effective and easy way. And then Texas Instruments are just cleaning up. I mean, here's a company that went from calculators to really bad computers, <laughs> chips has, right? And, and we're almost irrelevant until IoT came out. And now, all of a sudden, they're selling billions of chipsets again because they built in Zigbee and Z-Wave and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth Low Energy into a single chip, and it's unbelievable, and everybody's using them, right? At the same time, you had the jewelers, the people who did this concept of what's called upcycling, right? They took the raw materials, that gold, the nuggets that the prospectors were bringing back to them, and turned them into high-value jewelry, right? They had zero risk. Anybody who walked in their door already had the gold, right? There was nobody who came in and said, I'd like you to make me a ring, but uh, I don't have the gold yet, but if you make the ring for me in six months, I might have some gold for you, right? They didn't have that, right? Well, the upcyclers of the IRT space are the people who are doing the consumer interfaces, like smart things. The massive amount of data stream, uh, the analytics are going on top of it. And then the IoT security, right? To come back to the, uh, to the dongle concept, the fact that you can disable the brakes using a progressive dongle remotely, never mind the, the Jeep uh, issue that's, that's also out there, right? These are big, big issues. And then lastly, of course, the bankers the ones who bankrolled the prospectors to hand them to the hills in the first place. Well, in the IoT space, that's the angel investors and the IoT incubators, right? And the conferencing organizers, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so if you really want to make state money in the IoT space, if you really want to be successful, these are kind of the areas you might want to look at. Let's look at three practical examples. First of all, smart things. SmartThings is a hub that you have in the connected home 
that connects your, your August lock, your Schlag lock, your lights, and your all the different devices to the internet. It's multi-vendor, multi-mode, multi-protocol. It does Zigbee and Z-Wave and connects your Amazon Echo and all that. I've got one. I love them. Smart Things went from a Kickstarter campaign. In three years, they sold for $200 million to Samsung. We're now trying to roll them as part of their connected home strategy. And what's cool is Smart Things doesn't even make anything uh, IoT, right? It's just a hub for connecting all the different existing vendors together. They have almost no risk. And now Samsung owns them. In my case, AppMaker is my, is my company. Uh, it's a drag and drop platform for people to build their own mobile apps. Uh, as Jim mentioned, we've, we've done over 2.6 million apps uh, built on the business already, uh, over a quarter of a billion end user app views. It's drag and drop, no coding involved. Any idiot can do it. I, I challenge you, by the way, if there's any idiots in the room today, <laughs> to go and try and build it. We're working on a product at the moment, an IoT product, that's for plumbers. Um, where a plumber can take these connected water sensors, IoT water sensors, and for 10 bucks a month, give them to each of their customers, and then they have an app which shows alerts that if any of their 100 customers have a water leak, they know about it immediately, even before the customer calls them, and it's proactive business development for them, and it's a nice constant revenue stream. Right? So that's a great example. And then lastly, Lookout. I like my little unicorn. They're one, one of these few uh, pure app unicorns. They're 1.4 billion valuation already. Security is the number one Internet of Things challenge uh, going on from according to Link Labs. Right? By 2020, 20% of all cyber attacks are going to be on IoT systems, and 66% of networks will have a security breach, IoT security breach. Right? Security is going to be a huge, huge issue. Because when you have a fully connected home, some hacker anywhere in the world could turn off your freezer and thaw out your ice cream, and that would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but there are actually some real serious things, right? Now, Lookout at the moment is doing just smartphone based, but they are already protecting over 60 million devices. And they clearly set out to say they are, are, they are gunning for the IoT world. This is their target, and, and they've got a huge amount of uh, money they've raised to, to do that. So, if you're going to go into this space yourself, <laughs> And, and there's lots of great entrepreneurs I've seen today thinking about it. You have three choices that you need to make. Number one, start by picking a sector. Where do you want to play in the IoT space? There's home automation, there's retail shopping, tourism and footfall in, in, in uh, malls, manufacturing automation, environmental sensors, we saw a great one today. Um, the energy sector, there's over 700 million smart meters already out there. Uh, autonomous cars, transportation, logistics we saw today, agriculture, that sort of thing. Pick a sector that you're passionate about. Focus on that as a start. Then, find an existing problem that can be easily solved if only there was additional data or remote access. Right? The, uh, the water one, I'm sorry, what's it called again? What was your suggestion? Uh, the pulse pod. The pulse pod is a great example. Right? Where if just the farmers just had more data about, about meteorological uh, status in an affordable way, it can change their lives, right? So pick an existing problem that is just lacking data and remote access. August is another great example. And then number three is pick your part of the stack, right? You can start at the bottom. This is the IT stack. Start at the bottom in terms of the connected sensors, the connected controllers. We've talked about them a lot today. That's your nest of the world, you cicada, when we talk about, right? Um, the IoT hubs above that is like the smart things hub that connects the devices to the network. Or all of your cloud-based platform as a service and APIs and data warehousing and analytics, security and all that goes in there. Or at the very top, in terms of your consumer uh, interfaces, be that native or hybrid mobile app, a web interface, or dedicated interfaces uh, I saw somebody talking, uh, sitting next to him, who was doing with airlines in terms of pilot uh, automations. That's really cool, right? Um, pick a spot on the stack where you're going to focus. And if your business plan includes doing all of this, get out of the business. <laughs> Honestly. Tell your CEO he's focusing on the wrong thing, okay? Pick a spot because nobody can do all of it. This is really complex stuff. So. Let's re re look at uh, the key lessons of the day. 
Number one, it will take you at least two years to build and scale. So don't build an IoT business. Build a business that assumes that IoT is already ubiquitous. Because by the time you get there, it will be. Okay? <clears throat> Number two, the smart money always invests in the picks and axes. Look at your sector, figure out what are the picks and axes in that sector, find a way to do that. Three, ask yourself what problem could apps solve with access to instant or local data. That could be indoor navigation, it could be safety, security, anything about making better decisions if you just had better data. And lastly, of course, never trust your sister with anything important. <laughs> Thanks very much. As I said, we're show. And, uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. Or you can go for dinner. <laughs> yeah? Can you just put up the slide that shows the stack? I just want to... Sure. I also suggest if you, if you just Google IoT stack, you'll see like a thousand versions of this. Um, they are all, by the way, wrong, except for mine. <laughs> That was an easy question. I love it. Any, <laughs> any other really easy ones? Yes, sir. Is that really your sister? No. <laughs> and by the way, if this is being reported, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> I love. I love my sister. She's wonderful. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so with many of the IoT things, um, as you described, being transitioned to um, services. Would it be wrong to already start developing and assuming um, a service, or is it that you really do need to wait out until it becomes more widely accepted and integrated with everything else? I would definitely assume that it's going to happen. It is happening, and it's happening faster than you can build a business. Um, you look at some of those statistics when I see, so the curves that the at t showed today, I mean, it is crazy fast. Um, so by the time you come up with a business plan, come up with a product, prototype it, find investors, scale it, get it to market, and into the channel, it will already be ubiquitous. So assume that and plan for, work, like he said, where the ball is going, not where the ball is. There's no such thing as an overnight success, just by the way, if anybody hasn't figured that out. You know? Yeah? So you touched on the security in the Internet of Things space. Now, when you talk about that, do you see security vendors selling to the end user or the vendors on the... That's a great question. That's a great question. Can you repeat the question? So the question was, in terms of security issues, especially around the IoT space, do you sell security to the end user, or to the provider? Um, where, where, where do you go? And certainly Lookout, as an example, is going after the end user, right? The sense of comfort with your own device. Um, and absolutely, there are going to be people in that space, especially in the connected home, right? Secure your home, um, no, no doubt. But when I look at cybersecurity as a whole, really I tend to look at it from a liability perspective, right? Where's the greatest damage? How do you protect against that? How do you ensure it if it does happen, right? And, and from that perspective, you look at who's got the most to lose. So, for example, let's take the, let's take the Corvette and Jeep example that, that the AT&T Hal mentioned, right? I could find a device that I can put in my ODB dongle on my car that protects my car so nobody could come into it, turns off OnStar or whatever. That's great. And if you want to sell five million of those, good luck to you, right? But if 30 people have their cars hacked, and they die, guess who's gonna get sued for millions of dollars? It's General Motors, or Chrysler, or whoever it may be, right? That's where I would focus, because that's where the big concern is, that's where the real liability is, and they're gonna to wanna to know that their vehicles are, are safe. 